Well, welcome again to another edition of MEMA Supplier Insights. I'm Mike Jackson, uh, Executive Director of Strategy and Research at MEMA, the Vehicle Suppliers Association, and uh, very pleased to have with me here today, Jason Kaufman, U.S. Automotive Consulting Leader at Deloitte. Uh, Jason, very, very pleased to have you with me here, and really to kind of kick off uh, our partnership as uh, you know, our partner here on the uh, Automotive Supplier Barometer uh, for, for this year. And so with uh, the first quarter, uh, being on production planning and electrification. Uh, welcome and uh, great to have you here uh, for for to discuss the results. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. We really appreciate the opportunity to sponsor the barometer with you across this calendar year and, and increasing our uh, investment uh, across the supplier community. Absolutely. Well, listen, I mean, we've worked together for, for many, many years already. And so this is just a, I think, a really strong opportunity for us to continue to, to build on and, and to, to really disseminate uh, some, some great insights here. And so, well, let's just jump right into uh, the, the, the results and we'll, we'll kick things off here uh, with the, the results from the, you know, with the supplier outlook here that, you know, certainly on a, on a top line basis, We've got our uh, the supplier barometer index, and the question is the same. It's uh, describe your twelve month outlook uh, for your business, and over the past three months, how has your opinion changed? Um, and so, what's pretty remarkable here, forty six uh, is just four points below neutral, and yet what we've seen here is over the past four quarters, um, that's still it's still net negative. Uh, effectively, the index, the supplier barometer index, is a momentum index, and so what we're seeing is that for for the past four quarters, it's been uh, net negative. There's been more pessimism in the market. And so that simply means that you know, pressures continue to compound. Um, some th thoughts there from your side, obviously a, a bit of volatility here uh, relative to the economy and, and the rest. And so, you know, welcome your, your input. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Now, I don't think any of us are overly surprised with some level of, of, of pessimism, but I think there's still some underlying hope. I, I think looking at uh, annual volumes for the year of what's being projected are, are fairly solid. You know, it, it's not like we're falling off a, a cliff or any 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 kind of you know concerns from from that standpoint of, of overall volume. Uh, but I think from overall business, feeling the pressure of inflation, some uncertainty as we start this year. I think everybody finished really strong. We saw great bonuses for you know for labor this year coming from you know the big three and the like. So I think there's some positive momentum. Uh, but I think also the harsh reality of the uncertainties around inflation, banking, um, you know, with the squeeze on the overall economic. Uh, environment and then still some geopolitical uncertainty that's in play. I, I think everybody's being a little conservative going into this year with hope, but also some level of pragmatic, you know, um, planning of just being a little conservative to start the year. I think that's a great point, right? Because uh, I think you could argue that over the past uh, few years, we've started off the year anticipating, uh, hey, we're going to recoup some of the volume maybe. And then we had the semiconductor shortages that, that that you know kind of emerged and then from there it, it, it just uh, continued the, those pressures um and so uh, that's uh, just uh, some some reality but you're you're absolutely right and we've got another slide here a little bit later that we'll talk about that that um you know, on the production outlook greatest threats to the industry over the next 12 months uh, number one here weakness in the US economy um I, I think you know you 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 know highlighted just a little bit ago certainly labor inflation um and, you know, we just had here not reflected in these results, but certainly the Fed, you know, continues to raise rates. And so that's another uh, factor here, a uh, little further down, but uh, likelihood of higher interest rates. Uh, and I think, you know, realistically, we know that cost of capital is higher and it's likely to stay higher for a bit longer than maybe what was previously anticipated. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, production shutdowns due to supply chain shortages that's one where uh, you know a number of suppliers, you know, our members have faced some um, you know higher costs, right? And so the idea of of having to to curtail production, maybe keep some workers on because they couldn't replace them, they couldn't you know by sending them home, they have to continue paying them, and so that's represented another hurdle. Um, any thoughts uh, from from your side there? I mean, you did mention that you know we're we're looking at some additional volume here for this year, which is positive. Um, but obviously, supply chain has to manage, uh, you know, throughout uh, along those volume increases. 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I mean, I think the economy is a big question uh, for for all of us. Uh, I think some of the optimism maybe on the the smaller suppliers is there has been some relief. You know, you're you're hearing throughout the industry where uh, you know from a pricing relief standpoint, you know, tier tier threes, tier twos, tier ones are all kind of pushing. The harder conversation is for the tier ones and the OEMs, you know, to get to get that same. Uh, you know, concession just around pricing and recognizing the overall costs. Uh, clearly, car prices have, are at all time highs from from an average transaction price, and and everybody's trying to, you know, alleviate some of the pressure that is on that cost. And, and the suppliers clearly get you know a brunt of that. But with inflation continuing to go up, some uncertainty around just transaction prices and the compounding uh, cost of of loans. I was reading just this this morning. Uh, this is on the used side, but a used the average used um, interest rate is at fourteen percent. So clearly, you know, some over fourteen and, and some under fourteen, and, and new car prices going up as well. So, what does that mean also from a consumer standpoint? As they're feeling it on the housing side, feeling it with their overall all budgets. You know, how how bullish are they going to be going into this year with with replacement? Uh, vehicles and kind of keeping up. So I, I, I think, again, some of the sentiment around costs and what the suppliers are feeling, the OEMs are trying to weigh out through through consumers too. Now, that's a great point because, look, we know the reality, you know, average transaction price approaching $50,000. I mean, which is extraordinary, right? Because that's the average. So that we know that there are, you know, certainly manufacturers you know, they are are gearing their production toward those higher margin offerings. Of course, that makes perfect sense. But at the same time, then there are many consumers that come back to the market, and to your point, you know, higher interest component, you know, combined with that higher uh, monthly payment, all of a sudden, uh, it, you know, see themselves, you know, potentially priced out of the market, and and you know, that's all the more the case when we think of some of those consumers with regard to EV. Uh, so some some additional pressures there for sure. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the EV pricing has been. Pretty interesting to watch as as Tesla has been, you know, raising, lowering, lowering, raising, you know, uh, at, at a more uh, frequent rate than than others, and, and putting even more pressure on the system. As, as I think we all recognize the the R and D, the investment as we, as we pivot our portfolio into EV, uh, as well as all the software defined vehicle uh, investments happening, and in, in trying to get to the the next generation of electric architecture and the like. I mean, it's 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 a lot of capital. Uh, and, and getting your workforce, you know, to be able to sustain, you know, these new investments and to be able to create these new products, you know, there's there's pressure on all sides for sure. And no question, no question. As a, you made a number of really good points there, um, but it does kind of you know speak to one piece here, and maybe less of a threat in in this case. But as far as implementation of new government regs, maybe not necessarily regs, but obviously in terms of uh, Inflation Reduction Act and some of that spending in terms of opportunity. <clears throat> there are some um, kind of, you know, certainly Treasury um, uh, announcement expectation, right? That um, you know, clearly there's a, there's the potential for that consumer credit to be a, a, a meaningful driver here going forward. So that's clearly another uh, um, element we continue to watch for rather closely. It'll be interesting with the, as you mentioned, the Inflation Reduction Act, as OEMs and suppliers go and, and get those credits as they make investments around EV or hydrogen or charging networks and stations, you know, all, all the different aspects of, of where they can qualify. Even if you're a supplier not building the end battery, you know, is there an opportunity to share in those investments or the credits that are coming back from the government? It, it'll be interesting just how the overall ecosystem uses those credits in order to, in, in, you know, incent you know, further investment or or being able to share, even if it falls in the OEM's lap, is, is that something suppliers can share and participate with? You know, the benefit of the OEM going after the credit, but looking at the partnership and 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 how to you know bring us all together from an overall industry. So, um, in the positive momentum of from the U.S. really setting the bar, and and having you know between Canada and Mexico um, other actions happening in order to try to participate and and, and stimulate you know some of that development investment too. Um, I, I think it's going to drive probably some more further reshoring and nearshoring uh, in the near term, uh, which is you know further strengthens but also puts more pressure on labor 
as as more investments are here and we're trying to attract the labor to to do all that work. So right. it, it's exciting, but also I, I think again around that conservative nature of just the pressure that that our industry is feeling as we're chasing some really good things, but you know it, it's just one more thing uh, to kind of balance and, and to trust all for. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, clearly some competing pressures there. Uh, obviously, we want you know the the industry uh, to 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 be successful with these EV programs. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, the, managing um, both the the you know, managing the, the the transition uh, and 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 seeing those volumes. Uh, you know, clearly there are many many new programs coming. Look, I, you know, Jason, I, I'm super excited. I mean, that was a great conversation. Uh, look, I, I want to thank uh, Jason Kaufman, U.S. Automotive Consulting Leader at Deloitte, for his uh, expert insights here today as we reviewed the uh, uh, first quarter 2023 uh, automotive supplier barometer on production planning and electrification. Jason, thanks so much for your insights and uh, really appreciate the, the support, the partnership, and uh, look forward here to next time. Okay. Thanks so much, Mike. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much, Jason. Take care.